This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, it's all about the spies. Cause we're gonna be trying to influence different branches of spies and then once we dominate those branches, we're gonna be sending those spies off to do covert missions. Today we're taking a look at SpyNet. This is a tactical card game for two to four players from Z-Man Games. Recently did a rule school on a how to play uh, video of this. I'll put that link in the description. But let me show you a little bit about how the game works and I'll see you on the other side. The object of the game is to have the most points at the end of the game, and you're going to score points by playing mission cards in certain branches. This would be worth two points. These will actually be secret throughout the game, players won't know who has how many points, and you'll only be able to play these if you dominate a branch, meaning you have a higher total power than all other players in this branch. The game is played over a series of turns. Each turn, starting with the first player and going clockwise motion, they'll either be recruiting cards or deploying them out. And this will continue until this entire draw deck is gone, which will start the end of the game process. On your turn, you can either recruit or deploy. If you recruit, you start with the pile that's furthest away from the draw deck, you pick up all of the cards in this pile, and you secretly look at them. You decide whether to keep them or to put them back. If you put them back, you go to the next pile that's closest to the draw deck, you do the same thing. You secretly look at them, you either keep them or put them back. Let's say they put them back, and you do the same for the third pile if you had not uh, taken any cards. And let's say we put these back. If you go through all three piles and you still have not taken any of the cards in any of those piles, you would then take the top single card off the draw deck. Then for every pile that you looked at, you do what's called padding a pile. Padding a pile is adding one card to that pile. So since we looked at all three of them, we would pad these up. This gives the opponent more information and more things to choose from. So that would simply have been this first player's turn. Let's say it's the next player's turn and they also want to recruit. Let's say they look at these two cards secretly and they decide they want them. They keep them and then they simply just pad the pile that they looked at. Let's say it's the next player's turn. They want to recruit. They look at this pile, they don't want it. They look at this pile, they keep it. So you would pad again the piles that they looked at. That's how you recruit. Now let's say it came back to this player's turn and they did not want to recruit. They want to deploy cards, so they would take the deploy action. In this case, you'd be taking cards from your hand and placing them down in front of you. Now when you deploy, you can do any of these that you like and you can do them in any order. One thing you could do is you can play up to one agent in any branch. In this case, I just played this agent here in the blue branch. The number here shows me how much power I have in this branch. If I had more than one card, I would add up all of the numbers and that's my total power in that branch. When playing that single card to any branch, you can add one or more funding cards. There are gray cards that say funding and they essentially add to the power of that agent. In this case, we have two plus two plus one. So this is a total of five right here. And these cards are attached to this specific agent. But let's say for this example, we just played that single agent card. You can also play a single mission card face down for every branch that you're currently dominating. We're going to talk about dominating in just a moment, but let's assume that we are dominating this branch. We could place a single card, a mission card. These are ones that have stars on them. You would place it face down at the bottom of that branch. Now dominating a branch means you have more power than all other opponents in that branch. So in this case, we have a power of two, they have a power of one, and they have a power of none. Since we have more, we dominate, and that allows us to play one of those mission cards in that branch that we dominated. However, let's say this opponent also had two, we are no longer dominating, so we could not play that mission down. Now let's say it looked like this. We're actually dominating two branches right now, so we could have played one mission card in each branch that you're dominating. So we could have played one in blue, and we could have played one face down in green because we're dominating that branch. Some agents have text on them, and these are known as special agents because they activate abilities as you deploy them. For example, you can play up to two extra agents this turn whose overall printed power is five or less. Printed power means the power on the cards themselves without taking in effect any possible funding that might get attached to them. This is a printed power of five. This one says eliminate one agent whose total power is three or less. Total power is the power of an agent plus any funding possibly attached to it. So in this case, this is three, total power three or less. When you play this, you could eliminate this agent from another player. Eliminate means you completely eliminate those cards from the game and put them back in the box. 
This one says to eliminate one player's topmost agent in any branch. And as mentioned previously, the top agent is the most recent one played on anyone's branch, and if it is eliminated, any attached funding would be eliminated also. This one says discard one or more funding cards to flip one opponent's agent whose total power is equal or less than the overall value of the funding card discarded. Well, what does that mean? So if we deploy this one here, we could activate this text and discarding one or more funding cards. When you discard, you always place it to the right of that pile there. And that just shows you that we've discarded this card. Now this value is two, so we can flip any agent whose total power is two or less. Now over here, we have this agent that's two. This one also has a total power of two because we have one plus the funded. Even though it's not the most recent one, we can flip this, which means we take it and we place it right into our specific side. There's also mercenary agents which have a purple border. This shows it's a wild and that it can go to any branch. So when you place this agent down or if you flip it to your side, you can place it in any branch. Now, there are some special missions as well. This is a normal one. Most of them will look like this. They'll have a certain amount of stars. And as showed previously, you'll be placing these face down during the deploy phase uh, in different branches that you dominate. However, there are some special ones. Like this one says, this card is worth points only if you're dominating this branch. And this means at the end of the game, because all the scoring happens at the end of the game. So this would go face down like normal, assuming I'm dominating this branch, and assuming I haven't played a card in this branch as a mission yet this turn. And this card would give us points only at the end of the game if we're still dominating that branch. Some missions also belong to any branch, and similar to the mercenary agents, this purple background and these icons show that it can be played in any branch, assuming that you're dominating at the time. But at the end of the game, this card's only worth points if you are not dominating this branch. So in order to get these points, you have to be leading a branch, place this card there face down, and then at the end of the game, be not dominating that branch. So turns continue clockwise, either recruiting or deploying as shown until the last card of the draw deck has been removed. In that case, Everyone, including the player that caused this to happen, will get one last turn, but you can only deploy in that last turn. You're not forced to deploy a card. You can pass in your last turn, but the only thing you can do is deploy or pass. Then each player will flip face up all of their mission cards that they deploy throughout the game. If they don't have any text, it's one point for each of the stars that's on there. If it does have text, you have to make sure that you are following and fulfilling the text there in order to gain those stars as points. And then whoever has the most stars or points wins. If it's a tie, whoever has the most funding cards, not the values, but the number of cards. If it's still tied, you share the victory. If you're playing a four player game, it becomes a team game. And as shown in this graphic, you'll have two players that will be team A and two players that will be team B. You will sit across from your teammate so that the turn order will alternate between teams. So in setup, it might look something like this, where these two players are one team and these two players are one team. And when playing with four players, to see if you're dominating a branch, you must dominate more than both of your other opponents. So in this case, this is us, this is our teammate. This player has two for the green. This opponent has one, this opponent has none. You look at each of your opponents. I'm dominating more than this one, and I'm dominating more than this one. So in this case, I am dominating and could play a mission card face down for this specific branch because I am dominating. And even if my partner is actually dominating the branch, it's okay because it's my partner as long as I'm dominating both of the other opponents, I dominate that branch. But in this case, I'm no longer dominating this branch. Now I do have more than this opponent, but I do not have more than this opponent. And even though my partner dominates this branch, I am not considered as dominating that branch because I have at least one opponent that I am not dominating because I don't have more than them. There's also one more change to the deploy turn. If you decide to deploy, you have one more option, which is you can pass up to one card face down to your teammate. You can also play with an advanced variant called Situations. In the normal setup, we had to remove these cards. You can either shuffle these and use one for the entire game for everybody, or you could manually pick one that you'd like to use. Let's show you what some of these do. You would simply follow the text on the cards. For example, if you used Arms Race, you cannot play an agent in a branch that you are dominating. And if you're using this intel, infiltration, which is a green branch, uh, belongs to all four branches. So essentially greens are or wild. So you would just, again, either shuffle and, and deal one randomly, or you would select one. And that just changes a single rule for the game. 
All right, SpyNet. Well, this game is simple, but has good depth. I always talk about my depth to complexity ratio, where how deep can a game be with how simple the mechanisms. The rules in this game are very simple. You're either picking up cards or playing cards, that's it. But there is a decent amount of depth here uh, that can be you know, definitely uncovered, and I like that aspect of the game. Uh, this game is essentially, if you play the two-player game, is a very good tug of war. And in fact, I actually prefer this game at two players. I think this game is the best at two players. Now this game has a partnership game and it was actually marketed as a four player partnership game. Even in the rules, it gives you the four player rules first and at the end gives you a variant rules for two or three players. But I would say that this game is actually best with two a little bit less with three, and actually four is my least favorite. We'll go more about that later, uh, but it's a very good tug of war, two player tactical card game. Uh, I like that you're when you're looking through the piles and you're padding those, and you're taking cards, you're seeing what you're leaving behind for your opponent. Uh, so you're seeing what's there, you know what they, they, may be, they might get, and then you're watching what they take, and then you can kind of sort of remember, okay, they must have this card now. Um, and so I like that you're trying to, you're like you're seeing what you're leaving behind and you're watching how that influences their turns and future turns, and I like that. Which brings brings me to that padding system, which is, hey, it, it, you know, you're making it more enticing for others as you pad cards. So you pick up this card, you're like, oh, this one might be really strong. You might just want to take it either to deny them a mission that they dominate in or because it's really good for you. But you, you're always looking at the piles that's a little bit further down maybe that has a lot of cards and you're like, oh, is this one card worth it or should I just go get the other ones? Or you look at these cards, there's like three cards and none of them are really going to help you that much and maybe not them. You're not quite sure and you, you're like, oh, but this this other card over here might be really good. And so you've got this aspect of sort of pressing your luck here, and I really like that padding system. I also really like it when you can manipulate how long a game is. In this padding system, you can definitely change the length of a game with that. So, you know, if, if, if you think you're winning, you can keep padding all three and taking one off the top to try to race and get the game ending, where if you're losing but you think you're closer to doing a big move, you can take that first pile so you pad less cards, meaning the deck's going to go down slower. I love, like in Lost Cities, for example, one of my favorite two-player card games, that manipulation of the time is fantastic, and this has that too that I really like. I like that you can sort of like ignore an entire color. This other player, you know, they're doing great in this color and they're doing missions. You can ignore that color the entire game, but then pull the cards that have those missions and take those missions away so that they can't complete them for themselves. I like that aspect of it. I like that the sort of the scores, you're, you're not, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of uh, hidden in a way where you're, like, you're not really sure what they're scored, uh, which ones they've done. Now you can see where they're placing them and you have some ideas, but you you never know the exact score and I like that aspect of it. And I really like the situation variant. I'll use this every time it adds different things like green cards are always wild or in this game, this is that. It just really breaks a rule of the game. It makes the game have a lot more replayability with it. Uh, so on the negative, uh, one thing is, is, as I mentioned a little bit before, this is marketed as a four player game. Uh, but in fact, it's best with two, in my opinion. Uh, in four player, the luck is the, the luck of the game is, is higher. The magnitude of it's higher. You know, it's a card game. There's going to be luck of the draw. But in the four player game, you're getting less turns because the, the, car, the number of cards don't scale. And if you get some bad draws, it's harder to sort of turn around with that too. Plus in four players, we found that people tend to sort of specialize in, in one or two things. Maybe use a lot of times one, and when they come around there, their turns tend to be a little bit more scripted, not necessarily as tense. And it's a lot more. It just was. It just was much flatter for me with four players. And I do like the aspect of working with a teammate, passing them cards. That's always fun. And it's not a bad game. It just didn't shine nearly as well as I'd say the two-player game did. Uh, the two players, my favorite. Three is is good as well. Four is eh, it's okay. Uh, there's other partnership games out there like a lot better than this. But overall, uh, it's a really fun game. It's small, it's inexpensive, uh, and it does have a lot of tenseness there, and it's Richard Garfield, so check it out. And this is SpyNet. This video was sponsored by Miniature Markets Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com.